Beloved, grace and peace be unto you from God who loves us as a mother and a father and Jesus Christ, who alone and always is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning and our returning redeemer. I'm grateful that you decided to join in with worship today. I'm excited to share with you what I believe God has put into my heart as we get into the third part of our series, Can I Get a Witness? Listen, today, if the Lord moves upon your heart in any way, to not only want to become part of our church family, but even more importantly, to render your life into the hands and the heart of Jesus Christ, I want to remind you, all you've got to do is fill out that form online on our website. You can send an email to deacons, plural, deacons with an S, at alphastreet.org, and it'll be our joy to share with you the amazing things God has in store for you in salvation in Jesus' name. As we get ready to get into the word, won't you bow with me in prayer as we invite and invoke the Spirit of God to share with us. Lord, we thank you for your spoken word and how you stepped into the middle of nothingness and said, let there be, and there was. We thank you for your written word, our holy Bible, the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. I thank you, O God, so much for the incarnate word that when we seem to get the written word incorrect, you came in Jesus Christ, that we might see what the living word was all about. God, I ask now for power to preach your word, that the Holy Spirit would lift me above the frailty of my own sinful flesh. And Lord, that we might not just be hearers of your word, but doers also, that together we might experience the fruit of your word. Bless your word now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You all know a few weekends ago, we celebrated Easter. And ever since then, we've been in the wake of the resurrection in the season of the church known as Pentecost. Pentecost, these seven Sundays after Easter, these 50 days that lead us right up to the celebration of the descending of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles. We do that next weekend on Pentecost Sunday. If you look at the ministry of Jesus on the other side of the resurrection, if you read the end of the Gospels and the opening of the book of Acts, you'll find that on the other side of the resurrection, Jesus was really only about one thing. The message and the ministry of Jesus circled around one emphasis, and that was preparing those who knew he had risen from the dead to be witnesses of his resurrection and to be those who are commissioned to make more disciples. It's clear that we who believe Christ is risen have the assignment to share that good news with others and to make disciples. For the past couple of weekends, we've been gearing ourselves up to do that in this series, Can I Get a Witness? In part one, we examined that legal term, martos, witness. We took time to understand what a witness is and what a witness is not. Last weekend, as we got into part two, we unraveled and unpacked what Jesus meant when he said, go out and make disciples. And we looked at Paul's Roman road, which shared with us the ABCs of salvation. Today, as we get into part three of this series, Can I Get a Witness? I wanna invite you to a text that at the surface level may seem to have nothing to say or teach about being a witness or making a disciple. But if you pray with me, I think there's a powerful word from the Lord right here in Mark chapter 11. Whatever Bible you have before you, will you journey with me to Mark chapter 11 and listen for the word of the Lord as I begin reading in verse number 12. Mark number 11, beginning in verse 12. The word of the Lord reads as follows. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. And then Jesus said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him. They heard what he said. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. 
and he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it is not written, is it not written that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and the disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from its roots. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. As we hear that word of the Lord, I want to get into part three of our series. Can I get a witness? As you read through the gospel accounts of the life of Jesus, it is clear that Jesus did some strange things. Jesus did some things that confused and baffled his followers. Some things that left the disciples scratching their head, wondering why did Jesus do that? And in every instance, when we see Jesus doing something strange, it is a segue into Jesus teaching something critical about the kingdom of God. Whenever you see Jesus doing something strange, hold on, there's a lesson in there somewhere. Jesus did some strange things. They come to him one day and they tell him that his best friend Lazarus is sick and dying. And the miracle worker Jesus does something strange. He stays where he is and he lets Lazarus die to teach us something critical. That if you have faith in God, even when the worst happens, God is still able. Yeah, Jesus did some strange things. They brought him a blind man one day. And rather than laying hands on him and restoring sight, Jesus did something strange. Jesus spit in the man's eyes to remind us that sometimes the mess precedes the miracle. Jesus did some strange things. They, they brought him a woman caught in the act of adultery. And rather than speaking, Jesus looked down on the ground and began writing in the dirt and then looked up and said, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. Jesus was trying to teach us that none of us are worthy to condemn and judge anyone else. He did some strange things. He's in the boat one day with the disciples as they're crossing over the Sea of Galilee and a storm arises. And the Bible says that in the midst of the storm, Jesus was strangely asleep in the back of the boat trying to teach us that as long as God is with you, as long as the Lord is active in your life, as long as you invoke the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter what storm you come up on, God can still the storm. And yeah, Jesus did some strange things. But I agree with uh, William Lamar, excuse me, Lamar Williamson, who said that the strangest thing Jesus ever did was to curse a fig tree. Jesus curses and kills a fig tree. You're familiar with what goes on. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem with his disciples and the Bible says he's hungry. And he sees a fig tree in the distance with some leaves and he goes to it to see if there's any fruit. He finds that there's no fruit. But the reason there's no fruit is the Bible teaches us it was not the season for figs. And even though figs were not in season, Jesus does something strange. He curses and kills a fig tree for having no fruit when it wasn't fruit season. Why in the world does Jesus curse and kill a fig tree? What sin did the fig tree commit that made it worthy of being cursed by Jesus and killed by the Savior. It's not even the season for figs. Why does Jesus do something strange like that? And, and what is he teaching us in the killing and the cursing of a fig tree? 
Well, in order for you to really understand what's going down and to understand how this ties in to making disciples, I need to take you down the halls of seminary. Let, let me for a brief moment enroll you in Alfred Street Baptist Church School of Theology and come on into Seminary 101. I want to introduce you to a literary device that the gospel writer Mark uses repeatedly in his gospel. The literary device is called intercalation. Intercalation, I-N-T-E-R-C-A-L-A-T-I-O-N, intercalation. And intercalation literally means to insert something. And when used as a literary device, here's how intercalation works. An author begins telling one story. That story is interrupted by a second story. And when the second story is over, we go back to the first story. Here's intercalation. One event is being recorded. Another one is inserted in the middle. And then we get back to the first event that was being recorded. The best way to think about intercalation is to think about a sandwich. The bread is one story and the meat in the middle is another. In intercalation, you start one story, you insert another story, and then you go back to the first story again. That's all intercalation is. And if you understand that, then when you read Mark 11, we see a prime example of intercalation. The story of the fig tree is then interrupted by Jesus going to the temple. He goes to the temple and he cleanses the temple. He overturns the table of the money changers and kicks out those who are selling doves. And the next day when the disciples leave, they go back to the fig tree. Here's the intercalation. Fig tree, cleansing of the temple, fig tree. The story of the fig tree is literally intercalated with the story of Jesus cleansing the temple. I hope I haven't lost you yet. Fig tree, temple, fig tree. Now, the powerful thing about intercalation is that whenever you see intercalation, whenever one story has its interruption by insertion of another story, those two stories are always linked together that they are used to help you understand a greater principle. So the fact that the fig tree is intercalated with what happens in the temple means that the cursing of the fig tree is related to the cleansing of the temple and the cleansing of the temple can't be understood without understanding the cursing of the fig tree. The fig tree and the temple go together. That there's something about the cursing of the fig tree that helps us understand the cleansing of the temple and the cleansing of the temple helps us understand the cursing of the fig tree. Now, in order for you to understand what links them together, I need to share with you some biology about fig trees. Here it is, and it'll make all the sense in the world. The fig tree is one of the few plants or trees on earth that bears fruit before it grows leaves. Don't, don't miss this. The fruit bears before the leaf blossoms. The fruit precedes the leaf. Now, now, if you get that, go back to what happens. Jesus is hungry. And the Bible says that he sees a fig tree with leaves. And because there are leaves on the tree, he assumes there must be fruit because in the fig tree, the fruit comes before the leaves. If there are leaves, there ought to be some fruit. And so Jesus goes to the fig tree because the leaves suggested fruit. The leaves said, come here, we've got some fruit. The leaves said, we've got something that will bless you. The leaves said there's something here you need. The leaves said if you come here, you won't be hungry. The leaves said we've got a blessing in store for you. And so seeing the leaves, Jesus goes only to find out that this fig tree is guilty 
of having leaves, but no fruit. And what a shame it is to have leaves, but no fruit. To, to have that which says, come here and be blessed, only to come and leave empty handed. To have all the signs that say, we've got something that will touch your life, only to engage it and find out it's empty and shallow. And then you walk away as hungry afterwards as you did before. What a shame to have leaves, but no fruit. And that is what happens when Jesus gets to the temple. He finds out the temple has all the external signs of leaves, but ain't no fruit inside that rather than finding a house of worship and people in prayer, he finds a den of thieves. And Jesus is as upset with the temple as he was with the fig tree because you deceived me with your leaves and you yet had no fruit. Friends, may I suggest to you that our lives can sometimes be like that fig tree. Leaves but no fruit. Bibles in our hand, but no fruit. Crosses on our necks, but no fruit. Hymns on our lips, but no fruit. Church on our weekend agenda, but no fruit. Can I push it? Not only are our lives sometimes like this fig tree, but so can our churches be. The kingdom of Christ is filled with churches that have leaves, but no fruit. Crosses on the steeple, but no fruit. Grand cathedrals and sanctuaries, but no fruit. Pulpits and folks shouting in the congregation, and no fruit. Choirs that can sing you into a frenzy, but no fruit. And part of Jesus' disgust that we see in Mark 11 is that it is a shame to have the leaves and yet have no fruit. But there's something deeper going on. It's not just divine displeasure at having leaves but no fruit. But the deeper problem comes when you remember what the purpose of fruit really is. Can I take you back to biology? Beloved, you will remember that the purpose of fruit is not simply to provide something sweet for an animal to eat. No, that, that's the secondary purpose of fruit. The primary purpose of fruit is to disperse the seeds of the tree. You remember the difference between a fruit and a vegetable is that the fruit has seeds. And the primary purpose of the fruit is to hide the seed in something sweet so that when an animal comes and ingests the sweet fruit, the animal will also eliminate the seed and the seed will fall on the ground and the seed will produce another tree and the tree will produce more fruit and the fruit will produce more seeds and the animal will eliminate more seeds and the seeds will create more trees and the trees will create more fruit and the fruit will eliminate more seeds and the more seeds that are dispersed, the more trees. So the primary purpose of fruit is to help a tree multiply itself. The primary purpose of fruit is for a tree to make another tree. I wish someone understood where I was going with this. The primary purpose of fruit is to make certain that that tree can produce another tree that's just like itself. That fruit is about multiplying trees. And if there's no fruit, there can be no multiplication. If a tree doesn't bear fruit, it can't make other trees. If a tree doesn't have something sweet that draws people to it, it literally cannot reproduce itself. Beloved, if I haven't lost you, it ought to be clear that I'm not just talking about trees and fruit. I'm talking about our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. That if there's nothing sweet about your life, you can't make more disciples. If there's something about you that leaves a bad taste in people's mouths, 
They won't come to receive the fruit and you can't disperse any seed and you can't be a witness and make other disciples. Listen, listen, I don't care how loud you shout your testimony. I don't care how many scriptures you've memorized. You can know all the ABCs of salvation and have memorized the Roman road. But if your life ain't got no fruit, you cannot disperse seed and you cannot make disciples. And I am convinced that our biggest obstacle in making disciples, our biggest obstacle in being a witness for the Lord is not that we haven't memorized Genesis 11 and 31. It's not that you forgot the third stanza of a hymn. It's not that they're going to ask you a question about God that you can't answer. It's not because you didn't go to seminary and you don't read Greek and you can't translate Hebrew. Our biggest obstacle is that we have leaves, but no fruit. And rather than leaving a sweet taste in people's mouths that they might receive the seed and help spread it, we too often leave a bad taste in people's mouths and they say, I encountered you with leaves, but you, your life, and your church ain't got no fruit. People refuse discipleship not because they're atheists, not because they don't believe in God, not because they won't confess Jesus, but because they experienced a tree that had leaves, but no fruit. That that's what Jesus experiences when he goes into the temple, connecting the fig tree to the temple. He goes in and finds that this house of the Lord left a bad taste in my mouth. And it is that bad taste that sterilizes church. Jesus encountered three things in the temple that affected the temple's ability to be a witness of God and make disciples. And sadly, the same three things sterilize our churches today. Let me share with you three things that Jesus encountered in the temple that left a bad taste in his mouth and will oftentimes leave a bad taste in people's mouths today that is a hindrance to us fulfilling our commission to be disciples and make disciples. What did Jesus experience when he went to that temple? Well, it's something people experience today. And the first one is that he experienced predatory monetary practices. Predatory monetary practices. What left a bad taste in Jesus' mouth was simply how the temple handled money. And y'all, there's a whole generation of folk that have difficulty digesting discipleship because of how our churches have handled money. Come on, let, let me teach it and make you upset. In the day in which Jesus lived, the temple also functioned as the National Jewish Bank of Israel. The temple kind of served like a bank. In the temple, families had safe deposit boxes where they would secure family treasures and documents that were safe in the temple. In the temple, they would exchange money. In the temple, they handled commercial business. The temple was almost like a target, if you will. And there was nothing inherently evil about that. When Jesus went to the temple, he saw them selling doves and exchanging money. And there was nothing inherently evil about that. People had to buy doves. Pilgrims who made their way to Jerusalem had to make a sacrifice in the temple, but they couldn't bring an animal all that journey with them. And a dove was the cheapest animal that could be purchased to be sacrificed in the temple. And so when pilgrims would come from great distance, they had to buy, but since many of them were poor, they would buy a dove and then they would make a sacrifice of a dove as an offering to the Lord. There was nothing evil about that. The money they carried was Roman money. If you remember another teaching of Jesus, Roman money had the image of Caesar on it. 
which meant that it could not be used in the temple because according to Exodus 20, the Jews could not render an offering that had any graven image on it. Go on and teach the Bible, Pastor Wesley. And because Roman money had a graven image of Caesar on it, the money had to be exchanged to money that they could use in the temple to make their offering to the Lord. So buying doves, changing money was necessary. There was nothing inherently evil about money and the temple. There's nothing wrong with churches raising offerings and needing money. That's how we support and sustain ministry. It takes money to pay the light bills. It takes money to buy the resources we need. It takes money to pay the salaries. There's nothing inherently evil about temple and money. What upset Jesus was not that money was being exchanged or that doves were being sold. What upset him were the usury rates that were being inflicted, the markups, the fees, the interest rates. And what Jesus saw in the temple was a culture of commercialization that condoned the financial abuse of those who came to worship God. Let me say it again. What upset Jesus was a culture of commercialization that condoned the financial abuse of those who came to worship God. Here's what displeased Jesus, that he came to the house of God and rather than finding prayer, Rather than finding people giving their lives, he found those who were robbing worshipers and there was a culture that condoned commercialization in the house of the Lord. Jesus is upset and says, people are being robbed in the house of the Lord and you all are condoning it. You're allowing it. You're making it theologically appropriate to rob people who have come to worship God. Jesus saying you care more about what's in their pocket than what's in their heart. You're always raising some offering. You're using gimmicks and guilt and promises and pressure to get people to give. You're always lifting up an offering for a building fund and ain't built nothing. Every time we come, there's a love offering for the pastor. Every Sunday you're selling this or selling that. And sadly, our churches are infected with a culture of commercialization that allows the financial abuse of those who come to worship, but instead get robbed. I know I'm getting myself in trouble, but I have a question. If Jesus was upset by what he saw going on in the temple then, how might the Lord feel coming to some of our churches today? How would Jesus respond to prosperity preaching that says God's ultimate desire for your life is to be rich? How would God feel about TV evangelists saying that you need to sow your $1,000 seed offering into a ministry you're not even connected in to a preacher you've never met because God's waiting on you to sow $1,000 to give you a million dollars. How would Jesus feel seeing ATMs in the lobby so before the offering you could go out and get your money? How would Jesus feel about us raising five offerings, six offerings? How would Jesus feel about offering taking longer than altar prayer? How would Jesus feel about pastor's anniversary getting more press than Easter or the pastor's birthday rising higher than the birth of Christ at Christmas? How would Jesus feel sitting in our commercial churches today? And y'all, there's a whole generation that has come to church and they didn't find fruit, but they felt like they were robbed because of the abuse financially of how the church has handled its money. They saw Bentleys in reserved parking spaces, but homeless people right outside the church, no fruit. 
Offerings were being raised and hungry folks sitting in the pews. They felt robbed. Sanctuaries and cathedrals being built while historically black colleges and universities are struggling. No fruit. Private jets and helicopters while students are dropping out of college because they can't pay their tuition. We've been robbed. And Jesus is upset because there was more emphasis on raising money and abusing people financially than there was on praying and helping. And I just came by to tell Alfred Street Baptist Church and whoever may be watching that if we are going to spread seed and if we are going to be a witness and if we are going to make disciples, we've got to have some fruit. If we're going to make disciples, some rents have to be paid. Some meals have to be donated. Some groceries have to be given. Some tuitions have to be assisted. Some medicines have to be purchased. Some iPads have to be donated. Some schools need to be supported. Some coats need to be given away. Some supplies for kindergartners need to be sewn. Some empty refrigerators need to be filled. Some gas tanks need to be filled up. Some churches in foreign lands need to be supported. Some inner city programs need to be funded. That's why we feed the 5,000. That's why we are our brothers and our sisters keeper. That's why we tithe the tithe. That's why we gave $250,000 to Virginia State and to Paul Quinn College because we believe that if we want to make more trees that we need some seed. But in order to have some seed, we've got to have some fruit. But if we got some fruit, we've got some seed. And if we got some seed, we can make more disciples. Jesus said the problem is your predatory monetary practice. Can I push it? I, I, I'm getting myself in a lot of trouble today, so don't go and let me get to home plate. Not only did Jesus experience predatory monetary practices that left a bad taste, but here's the second thing that he experienced that operates in our church today. The weaponization of scripture the weaponized use of scripture. It's not just how we handle money that prevents us from making disciples. It's also how we use the Bible. Too many Christian circles have weaponized the word of God. They use scripture in a way that hurts more than it heals. They use scripture in a way that hurts more than it helps. They use scripture in a way that hurts more than it brings hope. Y'all, you have the right to disagree with me, but in my mind, the Bible is not a weapon. You know what the Bible is? The Bible is a first aid kit. It ought to help mend up what is wounded and what is bleeding and help hold you together when life has tried to cut you apart. The Bible is not a weapon. The Bible is an atlas. It ought to help guide and direct you into the center of God and know God's will and God's abundant life and God's plan of salvation. The Bible ought to push you closer to God, not push you away from God. You know what the Bible is? The Bible is a mirror more than a microscope. Uh-huh, you know the difference. A microscope is what you use to examine something else. A mirror causes you to look at yourself. And the primary purpose of the Bible is not for you to examine someone else's life, but for you to examine your own. Beloved, Here's how people weaponize scripture. They take a position that fits their politic or their privilege and they attach a scripture to it and suggest to you that that means it's the will of God. Let me say it again. Here's how the Bible has been weaponized. People take a position that aligns itself with their politic or their privilege 
They attach a few scriptures to it and then tell you that that is God's will. One more time for those who are writing it down. Scripture is weaponized when you take a position that aligns itself with your politic or your privilege. You then put a few scriptures on it and suggest that because you use scripture, it must be the will of God. Alfred Treat, I pray that one legacy I leave y'all when I'm done here is that you know that putting scripture on something does not make it God's will. I hope that when my time of being your pastor is done, the one thing you know is that attaching this chapter or this verse to that position does not necessarily mean it's the will of God. The devil used scripture. When Jesus is in the wilderness, the devil takes a position and tries to get Jesus to do his will and he throws scripture on it and tells him this is what God wants and the devil can use scripture. The devil still uses scripture today. A whole lot of what you see being used as scripture is demonic. That's why I like what Jesus does here in the temple. He shows us the right way to use scripture. Come on back to seminary. This is going to get a little deep. Holy Spirit, give me strength, courage, and clarity. I want you to see how Jesus teaches us how to properly use scripture. He comes in the temple. He sees what's happening. And listen to what he says. Is it not written that my house should be called a house of prayer for all people, but you've turned it into a den of robbers? Whenever Jesus uses the phrase, it is written, He's referring to the laws and the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament that were existence when he was alive. It is, is written is a re reference to Old Testament. So when Jesus says it is written, he's about to use scripture. He says it is written. He's about to use scripture. He's going to teach us how to use scripture correctly. And then he quotes scripture. Now, if you've got a good Bible that has some footnotes or uh, some notes in it, you'll read that what Jesus quotes is not one verse. No, 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 no. Jesus quotes two verses. He quotes, my house shall be called a house of prayer of all people. That's Isaiah 52 and 7. And then he says, and you've turned it into a den of robbers. That's Jeremiah 7 and 11. Don't miss this. Jesus is making a point and he quotes scripture, but he doesn't quote just one. He quotes Isaiah 52, 7 and Jeremiah 7 and 11. He quotes more than one verse. He quotes more than one scripture. He holds these two together. Matter of fact, he quotes more than one book which means that Jesus is familiar with Isaiah and Jeremiah, which means he's read Isaiah and Jeremiah and calls to mind Isaiah and Jeremiah, not just one verse, not just one book, but multiple verses and multiple books because Jesus understands you can't make a sound, solid argument of God's will on one verse. You can't say you've got God figured out on one verse. You can't say this is the only thing that could be God's will on one verse. You can't condemn people to hell on one verse. You've got to do more than that. You, you've got to hold intention, the entirety of the word of God. Beloved, I, I know, I know some of you may disagree and you have the right to, but I would suggest to you that the most hypocritical and judgmental Christians are those who refuse to hold the entirety of God's word in tension. The most hypocritical and judgmental Christians are the ones who want to build a whole system of judgment on one verse. That they will not hold in tension Genesis and Revelation. 
Matthew and Malachi, Isaiah and Jeremiah, Paul and Moses, that you've got to hold it in tension. And the most judgmental Christians are oftentimes lazy Bible readers. The most judgmental Christians are most oftentimes lazy Bible readers. Can I push it? Jesus quotes Isaiah 52 and Jeremiah 7. And here's what's going to blow your mind. Those chapters ain't got nothing to do with each other. They are two totally different topics. Isaiah 52 is about universal salvation and how God will offer salvation to those outside of the Jews. Jeremiah 7 is a prophetic word of God's displeasure with the temple. I want you to read Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7 is when God tells a prophet to tell Israel, will you sin and rob and murder and then come to church and stand in my presence and worship me like you ain't done nothing wrong? Is my house a den of thieves? Watch this. Isaiah 52 is about universal salvation. Jeremiah 7 is about judgment against the church. These two topics have nothing to do with each other. But yet Jesus understands that even if Isaiah is about this and Jeremiah is about that, that I've got to hold them in tension as I try to discern and understand the will of God. Because not only can I not fully understand God in one verse, but I can't just Google one topic and think that that's all I need to know about the will of God. That you can't just Google women preachers or homosexuality and come up with all the verses about women preaching and homosexuality and think you fully understand God. You've got to be able to hold the entirety of the word of God together. Uh, I'm getting in trouble. Can I push it? G Jesus says not just one verse and not just one topic, but Jesus uses these verses to remind the temple what God's intention was. The reason he says prayer and den of robbers is to remind them what God truly intended. Now here's where reading the Bible gets tough because ultimately Jesus suggests you can use scripture in a way that is misaligned with God's real intention. That, that, that what you ought to be searching for is not a literal memorization, but also an understanding of the intention of the word of God. And here's where it gets tough. To discern the intention, you must take seriously the cultural context of the writers and to those whom they were writing to really understand the intention you must take critically critically the cultural context to get at intention you've got to understand the context in which it was written so you can understand what God was trying to say what God was trying to do, that yes, there is divine intention, but it is wrapped in cultural context. And to get at intention, I've got to be able to discern what, what is intention and what is cultural context. And to understand cultural context, I may have to read more than just the Bible. So, to really understand Bible, I've got to read more than just the Bible. To really understand God's intent, I've got to understand the culture and the context in which God was speaking. And if I don't take culture and context seriously, then I really can't understand intention. That if Jesus says, you must know what God intended, then that means sometimes I got to pull off the cultural context that I may get at the deeper intention. 
Okay, okay, let me give you an example. This is what our ancestors did when they began reading the Bible and they heard slave masters quote Paul to them. When Paul said, slaves, obey your masters. There was something inherently in our slave grandmothers and grandfathers that says that can't be the intention of the will of God for me to live as a slave. And so they began to unravel the context and suggested that that was Paul's culture and that was Paul's context, but that was not the intention of the will of God because when we get to Exodus, God says, I don't want my people to be slaves. And so they wrestled with trying to understand how much is context and how much is divine intention. And when they read Paul and held Paul in tension with Exodus, they said, no, the God we serve said that we are not to be slaves. So whatever Paul is saying, it must be his culture and context and not the intention of the will of God. Jesus said, you got to do more than just one verse, more than just one topic. You got to do the hard work at getting at the intention of God. But watch this. I love it. And I want to see if you can catch it before Jesus quotes scripture. After he turns over the tables, the Bible says, watch this, that, that he stood in the temple and wouldn't allow anyone to carry money through. Jesus took complete control of the temple. Jesus shut it down and said, anything that comes through here must be on my authority. That maybe, just maybe, the highest criteria of the appropriate use of scripture is asking ourselves, does this use of scripture align itself with the authority of the ministry and the life of Jesus Christ? Here it is. More than one verse, more than one topic, get it the intention, but ultimately is the use of the Bible in alignment with the life, the lesson, the ministry, and the model of Jesus Christ. Because you can use the Bible in a way that is contrary to the life of Jesus Christ. I don't care what chapter and verse you cite. If you're using it in a way that contradicts the life of Jesus, you are using it incorrectly. We must hold Paul in light of Jesus. We've got to read Moses in light of Jesus. You got to understand Jeremiah in light of Jesus. You got to read Revelation in light of Jesus. And if you use it in a way that doesn't align itself with the authority of Jesus, it is being used incorrectly. Okay, okay. So, so let me give you an example. So let's say I'm trying to figure out this woman preaching thing. I, I'm trying to figure out uh, should women really preach or not? Because I've heard some different things. So, so I go and get my concordance or I Google women preachers and Paul shows up. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2. Paul says it's not by will that a woman should have authority over man and, and, and that women ought to keep silent in church. So, so that pops up. And I got those two verses, so I say, uh, so is that God's will? Should, should, should women be pastors? Should women be preachers? Well, if I'm lazy, I'm done. No, no, right here and right here, Paul said, keep quiet. Paul said, ask your husbands. Paul said, no authority. And, and so if I'm a lazy Bible reader, I say it's God's will for women to be silent because I read it in Paul. But then I look at some other stuff. And I got trouble. I got trouble because uh, I've got Miriam in the Bible. And Miriam helped lead Israel out of Egypt with Moses. I got problems because in Romans 16, when Paul is making a list of leaders in the church and those he wants the Romans to respect, he names Phoebe. He names a woman as a leader he wants respected. 
I got trouble because in Acts 21, Philip has four virgin unmarried daughters who the Bible says were prophetess and declaring the word of God. I got trouble because Deborah is in the Bible and Deborah is a judge who leads a male army in victory for Israel. So now I'm reading more than just Paul and more than just women preaching. Now I'm trying to hold the entirety of the Bible together. And then I got to get an intention. Is it God's intent to suggest to me that women are somehow inferior to men? I've got to ask myself, is God going to restrict someone based on their gender? Then I got to look at context for Paul. Paul lived in a patriarchal society that was restricted by their understanding of the role and authority of women, which is why when Paul writes, he says, I would that women don't have authority. It's my will that women not preach. Paul never says God said it. Paul said, I said it, which means it's my cultural context. But then I've got to ask a deeper question. Is this what God wants? Is this what Jesus taught us? Is this what we see in the life of Jesus? Because in the life of Jesus, we see a whole lot of women. In the life of Jesus, we see women supporting in our life of Jesus. We find out that the disciples would never have known Jesus was resurrected if the women hadn't preached it. The women knew and they ran back and told the brothers. If it wasn't for the women, we wouldn't have known Jesus was alive. I got to hold it in tension. I can't just make an argument on one verse that that's how scripture is weaponized. I, I, I'm sorry, I've kept you too long. Uh, predatory monetary practices, the weaponized use of scripture. But here's the third thing that I think hinders our ability to make disciples that Jesus experienced in the temple. You ready? A hypocritical hierarchy of sin, a hypocritical hierarchy of sin. You know what really hurts our witness? Our double standards. You know what prevents us from making disciples? Our hypocrisy. That in church, there's some sins we point out and some we cover up. There's some sins we expose and others we just turn a blind eye to. There's some sins we make people stand up and confess. And there's some sins we know people commit and we don't say anything about it. There's some sins we make you get out the choir because you're a bad witness. And there's some sins we allow to sit on the deacon board. There's some sins we expose and say you're going to hell. And there's some we let slide. The church, the church has been good at saying that that gay man is a sinner. But we've been awful quiet about adultery in the church. The church has been good about telling pregnant teenagers they can't sing in the choir. But we've had nothing to say about that husband who's violent towards his wife. The church has been quick to point out a lesbian couple and say that's an abomination. But we've let child molestation go time after time after time. You know what hurts our witness? The Southern Baptist Church having a whole lot to say about abortion. And this week we found out that they had a secret database with the names of over 600 clergy who were guilty of abuse and rape in their church and they kept it quiet. They had a whole lot to say about a woman's choosing what to do with her body and had nothing to say about 600 preachers abusing a woman's body. They had a whole lot to say about this sin and intentionally covered up another. You want to know why folk don't want to be disciples? You want to know why they don't want to sit in church? You want to know why they don't take the fruit? Because we're too hypocritical, and create this hierarchy of sin. Let me show it to you, and I'll be done. Jesus goes into the temple. He cleanses the temple. He begins teaching. And the Bible says, watch this. I love this. 
the chief priests wanted to kill Jesus. Now, now you should ask, why did they want to kill Jesus? It's right here in the Bible because the people were more attracted to what Jesus was teaching than what they were teaching. Don't miss this. Jesus taught one thing. The priests taught something else. And the people said, nah, we like what Jesus is teaching. There was a difference between what Jesus taught and what the priests taught. And I want to make sure you don't never forget that, that just because it came out the mouth of someone religious does not mean it's aligned with what Jesus taught. But beloved, hear me, hear me. Don't let a robe and a white collar fool you. D don't let quoting scripture fool you. Don't let reverend, doctor, bishop, whatever fool you. Don't even let this preacher fool you. Don't take anything simply because it came out the mouth of someone religious. You've got to ask yourself, is it what Jesus taught? Jesus taught something different than the priests and the priests wanted to kill him. Now, now here, here it is. Watch it. Jesus sees what's going on. He said, this ain't nothing more than a den of thieves, a den of robbers. You know what the den is? The den of thieves is where thieves would go after stealing because they knew they would be accepted safe and comfortable. Come here. The den of thieves is where thieves would go after they committed theft because they knew in the den they were around other thieves and they would be safe. They knew that this is where they'd be comfortable. This is where they felt they could just be themselves. So watch this. Jesus says, this is a den of thieves. The robbers are comfortable here and y'all want to kill me? Don't, don't miss the hypocrisy. The thieves are welcome, but you want to kill me? That group can come and sit, but this group is exposed. These sinners are welcome, but these sinners might be embarrassed. The, these folk can come and, and do what they want to do, but this group has to worry about their well-being. How hypocritical is that? What kind of double standard is that? That you would allow this group, but you would try to condemn this group. Shame on you, my brother. Shame on you, my sister, for creating an environment where some are welcomed in their sin and others are threatened. Can I push it? L let me go and push it and I'm done. The priest wanted to kill Jesus. And, 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 and Mel, here's the shout. That thought went through their mind while they were still in the temple. Oh my, they're in the temple and they got murder on their mind. They're in the house of God and they want to harm someone. What a sad thing to be in the house of the Lord that condones the culture of hurting someone else. How hypocritical to be in God's house and it'd be all right for you to want to embarrass someone else. What a shame to have leadership that condones belligerent talk in the pulpit, embarrassing people in the sanctuary, making people feel unwelcome and unwanted in the house of God, on holy ground, and got hurting folk on your mind. And beloved, I, I've lived long enough now, I've been in church all 50 years of my life, and I'm gonna tell you the greatest obstacle to our witness is not our witness. It's the witness of people who were hurt in church. Ain't no hurt like church hurt. Nothing stands in the way of being a disciple more than another disciple who hurt you in God's house. And here are the religious leaders on holy ground with murder 
on their mind. I'm done. I'm going to get off my soapbox. Feel free to send an email. But the truth of the matter is we need more fruit in church. We need something that leaves a better taste in people's mouths that they might receive the seed of discipleship. We need to offer a better witness. We've got to rebrand the image of church. We need some fruit. And I'm so glad that Brother Paul told us what that fruit was. He said you need some love and some peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. You can't sow seeds if you're not loving and you're full of hate. You can't sow seeds if you're always contentious and never in peace. You can't sow seeds if you're impatient with people and will not be kind and will not be good and will not be gentle and will have no self-control. That is the fruit of the spirit. And that fruit helps us sow seeds. That's what we're going to deal with on next week as we deal with the coming of the Holy Spirit to finally help us be the witness that God called us to be. I pray that the word of God has touched you. Again, if you desire to become part of this church family, if you want to know more about God's plan of salvation and God's love for you, reach out to us. We will reach back. Until we're able to meet again, may the hedge and the hand of God protect you. Let's look to the Lord to be dismissed. And now unto the almighty, the all wise, the eternal, the sovereign, the omnipotent God, who alone is creator of heaven and earth. To God has made himself perfectly known to us in Jesus, who alone is our Christ, our loving Lord, our sacrificial savior, our resurrected, risen, reigning, returning redeemer. To the God who chooses to dwell in these earthen vessels of clay through the sustaining power, promise, presence, purpose, and person of the Holy Spirit. To that all wise God be both glory and majesty, dominion and power from now until eternity. And the redeemed of the Lord who loved the Lord and were determined to be a witness said amen. It's Pastor Wesley. I'll catch you next week.